Hi, I'm Lorraine Berry, um, and I'm going to be in introducing Nicole Bernier. Much has been made about the fact that Nicole began this book shortly after the birth of her third child, and she finished it as she awaited the birth of her fifth. It's a lot to make a big deal out of. For those of us who do not have five children, it gives us absolutely no excuse for not getting our own writing done. <laughs> But I also feel that too much emphasis on this amazing fact about Nicole takes away from the book itself, because we should not be simply amazed that she wrote a book while mothering her children. We should be amazed that she wrote a stunning piece of work, period. Last week, on a whim, I downloaded the unfinished work of Elizabeth D. And within the first few pages, I had an uh-oh moment. As in, uh-oh, I have so much work to do, but I'm not going to be able to put this book down, so I guess I'll be reading instead of working. <laughs> Once I walked through the first page, okay, hell, after I read this paragraph, which happens to be the first, I knew I was reeled in. Quote, the George Washington Bridge had never been anything but strong and beautiful, its arches monumental, cables thin and high. Kate watched them spindling like ribs past the car window as her husband drove eastbound across the span. It was a testimony to optimism, a suspension bridge, each far-fetched plate, truss, and girder an act of faith against gravity and good sense. Anyone who can make crossing a bridge that millions of people cross every day and turn it into an observation about the human will is an author I'm going to want to read. And so I read. When I finished the book, I recommended it on my Facebook page. And one of the commenters was Matt Leone, who mentioned that Nicole would be here tonight when I said, wow, he said, oh, and would you like to introduce her? So here I am. I almost didn't get this introduction written because I started reading Nicole's blog. And the wry observations about human nature, the ability to make the most mundane of activities into a poignant piece of writing permeates Nicole's work. But the other thing is, Nicole is funny. Her blog is full of wisdom, but it's not all um and no jokes. Take this, for example, when writing about having no time to write. Most of my ideas, and most of the time I have an urge to write, don't happen to be when I'm sitting at the computer late at night and when I hire babysitters. So I have to get creative, send myself texts from the waiting room at the pediatrician, take notes on whatever paper I dig out of the diaper bag. This can be risky business. I've written myself notes on the backs of permission slips or teacher conference forms, as in, how well can a husband and wife really know each other, only to have the paper shyly returned? You might want this, one said, eyes averted. Anyway. I could stand here all night and talk about how much I enjoy Nicole's writing, but that would be selfish of me. So now my job is to say it's my pleasure to introduce Nicole Bernier. That was fun. <laughs> <laughs> and that is the first time I've ever heard someone read my work aloud. <laughs> Um, what Lorraine didn't say is that we did not know each other before, right? We didn't know each other at all before. We met the for the first time a few minutes ago. Um, I actually went to Colgate. I'm the class of 89 from Colgate, and I brought two of my children up to see my alma mater. Um, I haven't been here in 20 years, so this is a real treat for me to come back here. Um, my book came out two weeks ago today, and this is my first novel. I've been a magazine writer for 20 years. And I've been asked a lot of times in the media um, over the past week, little interviews I've done, what does it feel like to have your first book come out? And the only thing that I can think of to compare it to is um, as if you've been, just been gone for a while. You've been M MIA from your family and your friends, and everyone wonders, where has she, she gone off to? And it's as if you're building this vacation house that you alone have been spending all this time, and now it's built. 
and you're inviting everyone to come into the house and saying, look where I've been spending all this time. This is the place that's meant so much to me, and I hope it means a little something to you, too. Um, when I started reading, sort of like um, the speaker before us, I had not done any reading of my work aloud. I had done um, public speaking. I had even done some television work for my old magazine, but I had never read my own work aloud. And I realized as the days approached before my um, launch date that that was actually kind of a big problem. <laughs> so I sought out the most difficult place that I could think of to do a reading, some place that would really be trial by fire. Um, maybe I'd get heckled a little bit. Maybe they'd get bored and drool and fall asleep. And so I went to the place where my children do their piano recital a few times a year, the Sisters of Charity Nursing Home. <laughs> where just last Easter, when my daughter was kind of plunking out the theme song from Titanic, someone called out from the back, who the hell are these children and what are they doing in my kitchen? <laughs> Sorry about the bad word, kids. So I did go there this past week and um, I sort of started to, I was introduced by the, by the activities director and I got up to read a little bit and I got through the first page and I was sort of rounding the bend of the second and I heard some murmuring the next row. I decided I've got to speak slower, I've got to speak louder. And I started to go, and I sensed that I was starting to lose people. Say, who is she? And, I, and Fran, the activities director, got up and said, well, you know, this is Nicole, and she's come to speak to us about, about writing. And Do you understand what her book is about? No. <laughs> so I changed course, and Fran asked me, you know, do you have any writers in your family? Is there any, you know, history that you have for writing? I said, no, but my grandfather left me his typewriter. It was rescued from World War II. He was on the last ship to be sunk in the Merchant Marines. And all of a sudden, the faces started to perk up around the room. And it was a bit like that scene in Cocoon where they go swimming in the swimming pool and everybody kind of comes awake. And I started to talk more about the war. And bling, 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 lights were going on and eyes were opening up. And it ended up being a really beautiful thing. And I learned that the most important thing in a reading is connecting with your crowd and realizing when they've had enough and trying to take it somewhere else. Um, what I'm going to do, because this is a novel, and I don't have a lot of experience with this, um, I, I don't think it makes a lot of sense for me to read and just go straight through for a while, because um, novels are funny beasts, even though this is my first one. Um, there's a lot of stuff in here that you won't need to know, because it kind of lays the groundwork for going through. So I'm going to read about three different sections. Hopefully they flow together well enough that you don't even really notice where one dies off and the other one picks in. They're kind of similar themes, and they kind of tell a story going together. Um, so you can tell me afterwards if it worked or not, okay? I'm going to go ahead and reread what Lorraine was kind enough to read, just because I want to. And it's still kind of new to me to do this, and I like the flow. The George Washington Bridge had never been anything but strong and beautiful, its arches monumental, cables thin and high. Kate watched them spindling like ribs past the car window as her husband drove eastbound across the span. It was a testimony to optimism, a suspension bridge, each far-fetched plate, truss, and girder, an act of faith against gravity and good sense. The sun was strong, glinting off the bridge and hitting the river like shattered glass. Drivers traveling in both directions were shielding their eyes, staring, as she was, down the length of Manhattan. She didn't know what any of them expected to see. Mushroom clouds, skywriting in Arabic, she wished for some visible sign of drama where the towers had once stood. Then she looked toward Queens, even though it was impossible to see the sight from this distance. Few people were even looking anymore, though she always would. The car reached the end of the bridge and she exhaled. Chris glanced over and she faced the window with what she hoped looked like ordinary interest, damp palmed hands loose in her lap. He angled the rear view mirror to check the back seat. The children were still asleep. Has Dave gone back to work yet? His voice was grave in the way someone speaks about a bad diagnosis. She put her foot up on the dash. A few months ago, his company let him take as much time as he needed. Chris nodded, satisfied. It was the right thing for the company to do, and he liked when the right thing was done with a minimum of drama. What's he doing with the kids? Did she have family close by? No, there's no one. A trickle of cool air from the vent brought goose flesh to her leg. He found an Annie, a nanny through an agency. That was the, it's strange to think of Elizabeth's kids with a nanny. That was the first thing she had thought too, like Julia Child farming out the cooking to a housekeeper. People do it all the time, Chris. Not everyone stays home with their kids. He looked over, gauging her. You know that's not what I meant, Kate. She turned back to the window and wiped the corner of her eye as if she were ridding it of an irritation. A nanny in Elizabeth Martin's house. 
The obvious things weren't what affected her most. The obituary, the service, even visiting the crash site, a charred hole in Queens that seemed inhospitable to anything ever being grown or built there again. The smaller details were the potent ones. Seeing the open can of infant formula on the Martin's kitchen counter the first time she'd visited to help. Hearing that Jonah had lost his first tooth a few weeks ago, but Dave had forgotten to tell the tooth fairy. These were the things that gave certain days a dull ache she could not explain or shake. This would be the first time they'd be getting together with the children, but without Elizabeth. Kate and Chris hadn't brought James and Piper when they came up for the funeral, a maudlin affair made worse by the baby in the front row drooling and pinwheeling her arms at the photo of her mother on an easel. Now the kids would be playing together like old times, but for the adults, all the roles would be unfamiliar. Dave would be host and hostess, Kate just a polite guest in the kitchen. He might jiggle the baby on one hip, as he composed plates and poured small cups of milk, and Kate would offer to help, trying not to sound as if she questioned his competence. She would have to be social glue for the men who had only ever come together because of their wives, and someone would have to take the lead with the kids. We don't throw sand at our friends, and it's time to take turns with the backhoe. That had been Elizabeth's job. It had all been Elizabeth's job. I'm going to skip ahead a bit to when they arrive at the house and they're all standing in the backyard at a barbecue together. In the summertime, the Martin's house had been the address for late afternoon playdates and margaritas overlooking the sandbox. Their backyard was ideal, children contained and safe, but so subtly fenced that they didn't feel restricted. The simple swing set was not so extravagant that parents had to be vigilant, but was so well designed that kids believed they were pushing the envelope on their own safety and emboldened to small act of rebellion. Parents never turned down an invitation to a Martin picnic because it was one of the rare places where grown-ups talked and children played in coexistent, peaceful worlds. They even seemed to have fewer mosquitoes than the neighbors. It was a charmed setting and had added to the sense that God smiled on the Martins. Chris stood quietly at the grill, scraping burger residue with a steel bristled brush, his back radiating to Kate that after a few hours of small talk, this was hers to wrap up. Dave sat with his feet up on a deck chair, beer in hand, calling directions to the children playing hide and seek. When a child came close, a Martin or a Spencer, it didn't matter which, he'd reel the runner in by an arm or a leg. If his tickling was a bit more exuberant than necessary, the children were either unaware or did not mind. Kate sat quietly on the deck amid the noise. The sense of the missing member of the party was a fog low over the patio, changing the look and feel of everything. She surveyed the familiar yard, the patch of weeds where tomatoes used to grow, the rose trellis against the house, indifferent to its missing gardener, the wrought iron bench, chipping from its first season left out through the winter, where they'd been sitting when Elizabeth told her she was expecting again. Kate had felt a surge of happiness, as if she herself were gaining a life. Now 13 months old, Elizabeth, uh, Amy, Emily was no longer a baby, but not quite yet a toddler. Kate held her close on her lap, the small, sturdy body warm, hair soft against Kate's cheek. It was fascinating the way children grew, features morphing in and out of their parents' likenesses in a genetic peekaboo. The girl had her father's full mouth, like her four-year-old sister Anna, but her eyes were all Elizabeth, an arresting blue halfway between cornflower and sapphire. All three children had inherited Dave's thick, dark hair, and their mother had been loath to cut it on any of them, even Jonah. So far, Dave had left it alone, and the boy with collar-length curls looked more like a soulful Giovanni than a Connecticut wasp. Elizabeth had loved comparing their features, exhibiting the fascination of an only child when it came to the similarities and differences among her own children. Giving them siblings, she'd said, was the best thing she could ever do for them. Kate lowered her nose to Emily's head and breathed in Johnson's baby shampoo, a hormonal cocktail that among women who have children not long out of diapers drew the Pavlovian another. In Kate's midnight mind, the crash went like this, the plane dipping severely after takeoff, mild gasps of surprise, an unnatural twist and an overkill correction Views of the borough rising at surreal angles. Overhead bins falling open like startled mouths as the plane swung from side to side, then the scream of machinery failing somewhere below. 
in the middle of the cries and the terror, the laptops and purses streaking down the aisle, there had been a pale, still Elizabeth, frozen in her seat with the realization she would not see her children again. If she'd had long enough, she would have seen a parade of nevers, all the birthdays, graduations, weddings, the way her children's faces would look as adults at ages when they would barely remember hers, no longer certain of what was a memory and what was a photograph posing as one. If there had been only a few seconds of awareness, it went more like this. Elizabeth grasping the armrest, perhaps the hand of the person next to her, fragments of prayer, a desperate reflex, calling out her children's names and calling for Dave, but in the end calling last for her own mother, as we're all said to do. Sudden pain, or more likely, suddenly none. These thoughts always led to the same place, Kate's vision of her own children, alone with Chris after something had happened to her. Disease, collision, it didn't matter how it would have come about. Loss would hang on James and Piper like poorly fitting clothes as they moved through town, people touching their hair and saying hello more attentively than they ever had, some even offering small gifts, which would cause the children to confuse death with a holiday. The kids would walk to school with their father, his vacant eyes an open door to a corridor of endless tomorrows. As they moved down the hall, the crowd would subtly part. Preschool staff and parents would greet them a little too warmly, and if the children remained affectless, the adults would move on, taking consolation in the fact that they had tried. The Spencers would move in a bubble of grief, and everyone they passed would be briefly enveloped, but it would stay with the Spencers wherever they went. She knew this because she'd seen it with the Martins. The public grief, the children so ill at ease and still confused by ne the never coming back part. Kate shook her head in a reflexive shudder to rid the image. Kate and Elizabeth's close closeness had not been automatic five years before. In the beginning, playgroup was just playgroup. Kate's long-standing friends, the ones from culinary school, were now scattered around the country and cooking throughout the world. When she got together with them, everything was fast and ironic, even the humor felt hungry, and she felt at home in a way she hadn't when she was younger in the quiet, cerebral confines of her parents' house. Among her peers, she felt finally measured by what she could say and do, rather than by what she could not. Elizabeth was the opposite of fast and ironic. She didn't say anything she didn't mean, and she didn't forget anything you said. She remembered birthdays and old stories, called to check in after your wisdom teeth were removed. It was true that with her, you couldn't go to that place of unsentimental candor, giving air to the ugly things, like how you could love your family but resent your life sometimes. But over time, that seemed less important. You could vent your frustration over a child, the dinners not eaten and the chantrums thrown, omitting the part that you had to step outside gasping like a beached fish so you wouldn't say or do something you'd regret. And she would listen and pretend not to see the tears you pushed away, knowing you didn't want them seen. It was easy for Elizabeth to become the person you saw more than anyone else, the comfortable t-shirt you reached for mornings when there was no need to impress anyone. Even after Kate moved away, Elizabeth was always there checking in with a phone call at regular intervals, reliable as the tide. And then one day, she wasn't. Their close friendship had not been a typical one. They didn't have the shared history of work and old boyfriends. Elizabeth had never taken the bait to talk about marital chafe or admit that there might be a thing or two you wished you were doing in addition to, or even instead of, diapers. She wasn't even a neighbor any longer, someone with whom you could pass a slow afternoon at the playground. But that's the funny thing about people who don't fit into a box. They grow to infiltrate everything, and when they suddenly go missing, they are missing everywhere. This is a small scene right before um, Kate goes out to dinner with her husband, and it exposes a little bit of the anxiety she's feeling after September 11th that she's been hiding. She should have been looking forward to dinner, great food prepared and cleared by someone else. She would style her hair and put on her pink sundress, the one too feminine for her taste, but that Chris liked. They would have a glass of wine and comment upon the bar crowd and have uninterrupted conversation that was broad and worldly like the old days. Her edgy humor would return, and he'd smile at her in the loose way that showed pleasure unrelated to his work. And when they returned to the bungalow, the sitter would be hastily paid, and there would be no flossing before bed. But that apathy was creeping in again, the sense she'd had lately that things didn't quite live up to their billing, so why bother? 
It was the same ambivalence and letdown she felt a few weeks before out to dinner with friends. She genuinely liked the women, other mothers from Piper's preschool, but had the sense of dislocation all evening. Kids' activities, home renovations, none of it mattered. She was unable to shake the sense that none of it could be counted upon to last. She had started feeling this way after Elizabeth's death, but instead of fading as the months passed, it intensified. Sometimes it was a fog, a sense that she had not a single thought in her head worth sharing. Sometimes it was a growing panic that at any moment something could go very wrong. She'd always been conscious of her family's safety, but this was different. Danger was everywhere and nowhere, immediate and elusive, and no one was prepared. It was as if she alone could smell it, subtle as the metallic first moments of rain. She hadn't said anything to Chris, unable to imagine it, but she could imagine his response. After he stopped smiling, because surely his first thought would be that she was kidding, his look would change from one of identification to one of sympathy. He would suggest that maybe she should find someone to talk to, because it was quite a thing to lose a friend, and well, maybe everything that had followed had hit her especially hard, too. The fact of his suggesting it would be enormous, because he was an own bootstrap sort of man, and the word therapy was not part of his lexicon. That was her fear, not professional help, which had occurred to her, but which she hadn't believed was necessary, but that Chris would look at her and see instability and weakness. It had been a long time since they'd gone out to dinner together, just the two of them. She could envision a staggered silence, one line of conversation after another, failing to catch hold, until they finally chatted about the weather expected the next day and whether to go to the beach. There were many evenings back home when they moved around and past one another, wordless for hours at their own tasks. She was thankful for the few hours of quiet focus, but at moments she felt the loss of quiet companionship a like-minded silence. Their daily lives were so different now, she could no longer say whether they were of like mind. Was it possible, she wondered, to have solitude together? She tried to imagine what he would do if after dinner she went to his study back home with her book or her laptop and sat on the couch there instead of in the living room as they had in the early years. He might glance over the top of his computer with a look of surprise and then a smile of welcome. Hey there. Or there might be a moment's hesitation. She'd sit quietly nearby, each of them feeling the weight of the other in the room and a dampening of his or her own thoughts, each looking up expectantly when the other shifted in a chair or looked off in the middle distance. She might offer a snippet of commentary about something she was reading, but it would not be easily understood out of context. After an hour or so, she would stand and stretch, murmur that she thought she'd call it a night, and the following night she'd go back to the living room it was a gift, solitude, but solitude with another person, that was an art. <laughs>